Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established for us the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken no falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord.
reach, a laughing stock to my neighbors, and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. My trust is in you, O oh Lord. I say you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similar, similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who is able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. The Passion of Our Lord, of Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had met there often with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. 
Jesus, knowing everything that was to going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at, at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me and what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you question me? Why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, 
my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into to the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top down. So they said to one another, in order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. 
This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happens so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with, a, with burial clothes, along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In your life when you bear heavy burdens, does anyone ever offer to help you carry that burden? Jesus does. And we remember today on this Good Friday, not just that he helps us carry our burdens and our weakness, but we remember today how Jesus carried the burden of sin, the sin of the whole world, the weakness of the whole world, the failure and brokenness of humanity. He bore that pain. He took upon himself the burden of our sins and the sins of all, and he was the sacrifice that was to reconcile us with the Father. In so doing, he certainly shows us God's mercy and his tender love. But in so doing, he also assures us 
that when we are burdened either by sin or by our own personal crosses, that we are never, ever alone. My sisters and brothers, on this Good Friday, Jesus invites us not to be spectators to his passion and death, as if we were watching a movie. But in this liturgy, Jesus invites us to walk with him on his road to Calvary. In fact, he invites us to walk next to him. We know from the scriptures and from our tradition that it was a very long and painful walk. And all of us are very familiar with the physical suffering that Jesus embraced, the burden of that suffering. A crown of thorns crushed into his skull, whipped like an animal, falling under the 100-pound cross that he was supposed to carry as the burden of humanity. Nails hammered into his wrist and his feet, and it was a bloody mess, a bloody mess on Calvary. But my sisters and brothers, we remember today that the suffering of Jesus and the burden that he bore was not just physical, it was also emotional. And it does us well on this Good Friday to get into the feelings, the emotions of Jesus, and into the brokenness of his heart. Yes, he was sold by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Complete betrayal. Peter denied even knowing him after Peter had just said before, I would never, ever, ever deny you. He was unjustly condemned and put on death row, given a death sentence. And Pilate believes that he's innocent. But because of political power and because he wants to be politically correct, he condemns him to death. Not only was Jesus stripped of his clothes, he was stripped of all human dignity. And the disciples, as we know, drifted off one by one because they were afraid. And so he dies on the cross, not exactly alone, but the only ones at the foot of the cross were his mother Mary, John, and two other women. He's bleeding, but also his heart is broken. And as he takes his last breath, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he says, it is finished. Today, we express faith and gratitude to the Lord Jesus because in his physical and emotional suffering, he carried the burden of sin, the sin of the world, and our own personal transgressions. He became the sacrifice to reconcile us to the Father. No more would it be goats or calves, but the Son of God would be the sacrifice that would reconcile us to the Father. God's Son would do that. And from that cross, he says, my Father loves you, and my Father forgives you. He not only carries the burden of sin and failure of people long ago, but also today. He says to us, if you are truly my disciple, you will take up your cross and follow me. Jesus bore his cross. But he makes it very clear that if we are to truly be his disciples, we will have crosses in our lives. And we must take up those crosses and follow him. In so doing, we have the opportunity to unite our sufferings, our cross, to that of Jesus. Realizing that when we bear our cross, we are never, ever alone. He is with us, the one who offers to carry the burden with us. As we know, our crosses are not wood, usually. They have no nails driven into them. Nonetheless, each and every one of us bears crosses. 
And sometimes our cross is unseen, it's, et it's internal. It can be in those powerful moments of loneliness, or when we feel depressed, or when we've given up hope, or at least tempted to give up hope. It could be at a time in life when there are so many complicated questions, but it seems like there are no answers. Perhaps it's at that moment that we're not sure that we believe in God's mercy because the past keeps coming back to haunt us. Those are internal crosses that we sometimes bear. We also know that sometimes our crosses have a name and a face. Being with someone we love who is in hospice or suffering the grief the death of someone to whom we were very close can take life out of us, especially in those unique moments when it's a child. Our crosses sometimes are the way in which we are treated by others without respect. Those who in life have betrayed us, those who in our lives have been unfaithful to their commitments to us. And those crosses can be family tensions or an addiction that we really want to overcome, but we feel powerless. No one chooses to be addicted. And we wish to give up that addiction, but feel powerless. Or maybe it's because we keep falling into the same sin over and over and over again. Those are the crosses we bear. And we're mindful that Jesus offers to help us carry the burden of those crosses. Jesus fell under his cross three times, tradition tells us. Sometimes we feel that we have fallen more than three times and we really need him to pick us up and help us to walk. And so we ask the question today, has anyone lately offered to help you carry your cross, your burden? Perhaps it's the cross, a burden of sin, or one of these other crosses that we have no control over. Has anyone lately offered? Yes, yes, on this Good Friday we say, yes, Jesus, you have. As we walk with him in his cross, in his suffering, so he walks with you and me in the sufferings that we bear. May I suggest today that before we leave this cathedral, or at least before we go to bed tonight, that we stand or kneel at the foot of his cross, a crucifix. Just stand there, kneel there. Just be quiet. Don't speak. Just look at him and see him looking at you. And then he says, I'm carrying your cross. I'm carrying your cross with you, and I willingly do so. Do we believe that? Do we take him at his word? Or do we try to do it all by ourselves? Please stand. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, and to unite her throughout the whole world, and to grant that le leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty.
Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope you have chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our Bishop Gregory, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. We pray to the Lord, Lord Almighty ever living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their innermost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having receiving, received forgiveness for all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, you make your church ever fruitful with new offspring. Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as, the, as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. We praise you, Lord, Lord, Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, you bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants. Graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter the way of salvation. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. We pray to the Lord, 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 Lord
Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you, and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, the freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. collection taken at this time is the annual Good Friday collection for the Holy Land. Catholics throughout the world are called on to support Christians in the Holy Land. Requested by the Holy Father, this collection offers a direct link for all Catholics to be witnesses of peace and to help protect the holy places. Your generosity, as always, is greatly appreciated.
please join in singing hymn number 217, What Wondrous Love, number 217. My friends, we pray as the Savior commanded us, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please kneel. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be. Please join in singing hymn number 196, Jesus Our Living Bread, Panis Angelicus, number 196.
You are worshiping today in the oldest active cathedral in the United States. Parts of this venerable building are over 220 years old. Constant repair and renovations are needed to maintain this historic old cathedral in its beautiful state. We ask for your monetary assistance so that we may continue to worship God in this place as has been done since 1718. Envelopes are provided in the pews for your convenience and we thank you for your support. Let us pray. Almighty ever living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, may comfort be given, may holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. <laughs> 